Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Help, my clusters on the internet, uh, container security fundamentals. Uh, my name is Samuel Davidson, uh, there's my LinkedIn and, and website if you're interested, picture of me. Uh, and I will be your tour guide through the wonderful world of container security in Kubernetes. Uh, so again, a little bit about me. My name is Samuel Davidson. I've been at Google for about three years, um, two and a half of which I've worked on GKE, the Google Kubernetes engine on the security team. Um, on that team, I've done a ton of work with identity and authorization. Um, before joining, I was a total Kubernetes beginner. So I've kind of got that perspective of not knowing what's going on to knowing a lot about Kubernetes security. So to the title of the talk, uh, again, help my clusters on the internet. There's your cluster floating around in the cloud of the internet. And typically, yeah, uh, your cluster is on the internet. It's how your devs access your API server and configure workloads and, and uh, set policy and all that. Um, and it's how your users uh, can access their pods or their data, or you serve API traffic, all that. But I'm, as I'm sure you know, the internet is a very scary place with uh, bots and trolls and bugs and malicious third parties and bad guys and your developers are making mistakes. And all of these are working against you to compromise your cluster to cause your organization some pain. So uh, I'm going to be walking you through a whole bunch of tips and tricks to help mitigate uh, all these risks. So before we dig into that, let me briefly talk on the structure of this talk. Um, first, we're going to be looking at workload security, so the pods and containers then cluster security, which will be like the control plane and the nodes. And then we'll be looking at user security, which is like all of your developers, your automation, your CI CD and all that. Um, so starting with workload security, there you are with your with your laptop and you've got a workload to deploy and you want to make it secure. What do you do? Um, first and foremost, what you think what you need to think about is that you need to assume that you'll be owned. And this is a recurring theme throughout the entire talk. Um, uh, you've got to assume that there is a uh, there's a yet to be discovered vulnerability in one of your dependencies or in one of your base images that will allow remote code execution, data exfiltration, whatever your definition of owned might be. So let's look at a let's look at an example here. Container one uh, has all of these tools, these Linux tools, file systems, a whole bunch of keys, full networking capability, and container two is a soft padded baby's crib. Uh, with a nice purple plastic key that maybe isn't useful for much, just one specific goal. Now, which of these containers would you rather an attacker own, right? Uh, there's container one where they have all the, the suite of, this huge attack surface, suite of possibilities, uh, or container two where they're kind of trapped in a little cage. Um, obviously, this is a kind of jokey analogy, but we want to make our containers look more like container two. So how are we going to do that? Uh, the first and most easy thing you can do is to use a distroless base image. Um, if you aren't familiar with distroless, let's take another example here. Uh, we've got Debian 10, which is kind of like this big shiny pickup truck. Uh, this truck's great. It's got a big cool shell. It has all kinds of fancy features. It's got that, that you know, anti-lock brakes and, and steering assist and whatever else. It's got all the cool tools built into Debian 10. And it's also running on top of the Debian kernel, which would be like the wheels and the engine. Um, the distroless release of, of Debian 10 is more like just that kernel. It's got the wheels and the engine, the bare bones to move forward. So mostly, for the most part, your workloads do not need that suite of, of amazing options that, that Debian has baked in. And they just act as a basically attack surface that when someone owns their cluster, they can use the shell to ping around, to curl all kinds of endpoints within your cluster and cause you a bunch of problems. So how do we transition from Debian 10 to the distroless Debian 10 or whatever other uh, you know, distribution of Linux or operating system you're using? Um, it's really easy. So here's a, an example Docker file. You can see they build their binary with a sort of Golang builder image, and then they copy that build, that build binary into uh, Debian 10, and that is sort of the output container that is used. To transition to distroless, you simply replace Debian 10 with a distroless path to base Debian 10. And again, you don't need to be using Debian 10. There's other distributions. There's distroless versions of all kinds of operating systems, but they all strip out sort of all of those tools and shells and stuff that an attacker might use. Um, I just want to note that there's a builder pattern used here where they build the binary before copying it into the 
uh, the final sort of base image, and you will have to do that because the distro list is so bare bones that compilers won't even really run in them. Um, if you want to read up on distro list, pause here, go to that bit.ly link, or you can just Google distro list. Super easy, super common. Um, number three is you want to make sure that your containers are really easy to rebuild and really easy to deploy. Um, why is that aside from just the convenience? Um, well, typically a lot of the vulnerabilities, the critical vulnerabilities and security issues you'll run into are actually, like I said, in your dependencies, in the packages you pull in or your base images. So often you'll have an exchange like this where an engineer might come and they say, help, I've got a critical vulnerability in my container. Ah, you know, uh, how much work is this going to be? Well, if you're, uh, if your containers are easy to rebuild and deploy, you just bump that dependency number, bump the base image, edit the Docker file, you know, one line change, and let the CI CD platform take the take the reins. So here's a you know a wall of CI CD platforms. It's typically how people accomplish easy rebuilds, easy deploys. Um, obviously, there's a bunch of recognizable brands there. This is taken from the CNCF landscape. Um, so I recommend you set up a CI CD platform that makes all this whole process easier. Um, and similarly, you want to trust your containers with signatures. This is another cool feature of the CI CD environment, which is signatures, which are also known as binary authorization, signed containers, image signing, binary attestation, content trust, depending on the platform or the brand or whatever, they use these different names. Um, but they're basically the same thing where whatever built your container, whatever your compiled your code and containerized it, attaches a signature to it from their they have a trusted private key that you've given them and they use that private key to sign, you know, the hash probably of the container. Um, and here's an example of how that's useful is let's say your company has a repository of all your containers and the access control list for it isn't super well set up so developers can maybe push to it. And a developer could make a mistake or get their credentials compromised and be pushing untrusted, buggy, or intentionally malicious code to your repository by building it locally and pushing it with either unsigned or with an untrusted signature um, and give it those sort of latest tags. So uh, maybe your naively set up Kubernetes cluster would start to pull those containers and run them no questions asked, um, which is a pretty huge risk. So if we utilize signatures, we can uh, have our trusted CI CD platform, which has that tr private key that we've given it that we sort of has told, have told our cluster to trust, and it will attach a signature to that container it spill, spits out. And our CI CD platform can be configured to only pull reviewed trusted code in our master or release branches on GitHub, for instance. Um, and signatures have a bunch of other really awesome properties we can, we can use for them. In your CI CD platform, you can uh, do dependency validation, vuln scanning, you can run a suite of integration tests, and each one of these phases can each have their own signature. So as our reviewed code is compiled and pushed through all these phases, um, it can get a signature as each of these phases is successful. And then the final output container can have all of these signatures that sort of provide guarantees that we've run all of these tests, we have run all these dependency validations, and no major issues arose. So uh, we can then, as I said, take your Kubernetes cluster and configure it such that it will only admit containers that have these six um, or you know, valid dependencies, pass tests, and all that. And right here, you can see I say some policy engine require signed containers, and then a whole bunch of you know public keys for these signatures. This is pseudocode. I will discuss more about how to configure your policy engine later at the cluster level. Um, but just know that for now, you want to make sure that your containers do have a trusted signature sort of pipeline set up for them. Okay, so that was container. Uh, just as a recap, assume you'll be owned, use distroless, rebuild your containers, uh, or make them easy to rebuild and redeploy, and sign uh, all your containers. Uh, now what about at the pod level? So at the pod level, I'm gonna be giving all kinds of rec recommendations that concern the pod spec, which is used all over the place. Um, and these tips all apply there. So obviously in your pods, you have a pod spec, but also in your daemon sets and jobs and cron jobs and replica sets and stateful sets and any other uh, Kubernetes resource that might want a pod spec. Um, it's, these tips apply. And here's the pod spec reference if you want to pause and go read the fields. Uh, there's a bit.ly link. So number one, uh, don't use host path. 
Uh, this might seem convenient because it basically takes your container and it gives it a little window into the nodes file system. You give it a directory in the nodes file system and your container can mount that directory and can read the contents. And maybe you have a key there or a config there. It's, it's convenient. It's a nice place to, to just have those files that you need to load in at runtime. But uh, it's, it's sort of a very risky Trojan horse you're, you're, uh, you're setting up for yourself where you don't know where that file system is going to be some time from now, right? You don't, it can see all the subfolders. Maybe the file system is editable by a whole bunch of other pods and other services. So uh, it's pretty risky. It's, it's a, a, an attacker can explore this file system and pull out all kinds of sensitive information. So what does it look like in code? Um, it's under, it's a volume field. So in your pod definition, you would, uh, here's a very simple example. You can see it just pulls in basic container image, and then it mounts a volume we define called keys volume. And all keys volume is, is a host path to some made up directory, in this case, et cetera, slash pod data. And you know, maybe you did just barely make this folder. You only put a config file in there. You trust it. You know, it's not very scary right now. Um, but like I said earlier, what about a year from now? Do all of your other developers know not to reuse this pod data folder? Will other pods start to like put all kinds of crap in the, in the pod data folder? Um, there's just a zillion better ways to do this. So don't do it. Uh, use secrets or something like that, which we'll discuss later. Um, number two, don't use host network. And this is pretty similar. It ties your containers network into the nodes network. So local host on the node is local host on the container. It shares the same port range. Um, some people do it because it's kind of convenient for your container to network to other sort of things on the node, um, but it's super risky. So in this case, the container can, through localhost, ping you know, the SSH server on the node or the various Kubernetes services, and so can an attacker who owns your container. Um, and the problem, the biggest problem here is localhost is kind of treated like a trust domain, like things running on localhost on the node are trusted sort of uh, system infrastructure level services, not arbitrary Kubernetes workloads. So things like the kubelet um, provide some level of trust for API requests coming to it from localhost, um, which an attacker might exploit. So don't use host network. Um, it's just a field on the pod spec. So in code, here's another pod example where this pod has host network set to true and it's bound to the four fours port. Um, just don't include this line. If you are using it, you should really look into other networking alternatives, see if it's actually something you need or if it was just set there arbitrarily. Make sure it's not enabled. Um, number three, and this is something that a lot of people probably overlook, which is to be conscious of your pod service account. So here's a super simple pod spec. Um, all it has is a container image, a path, and a name. Is there, you know, is there a concern about security or service account credentials bound to this pod? Are there credentials loaded in it? Or do we have any sort of concerns like that? It doesn't look like it. It's a very simple pod. Well, the answer is yes. Uh, every pod is bound to a service account, whether you like it or not. Um, if no service account is specified, the default service account is bound, which is named default. Um, this pod is in the default namespace, so it gets the default service account in the default namespace. Um, and in this exact pod, those credentials to act as that service account are actually loaded in the file system available to that container at this path under secrets, um, which an attacker who owns this container now has access to act as and ping your API server and perform all kinds of malicious requests. Um, and you know, such a simple pod spec like this might be running something you don't even trust that much. It's just a test app that might be buggy. So it's really something to be aware of. On the bright side, the default service account usually isn't bound to anything by default. It doesn't have any permissions associated with it, but you never know if someone earlier on went and added permissions to it to like simplify some workflow um, and now it's exposed to it. So thankfully, there's a bunch of super easy uh, solutions to this. Uh, first is you just simply bind a, sim a different service account name to this pod. So in this case, I, uh, you know, I made this service account called Simple SA. Uh, it's brand new. It doesn't have any permissions bound to it. And we kind of like trust that it is blank or it has only the bare amount of permissions needed. Uh, better yet, put the pod in a different namespace. So this time I put the pod in its own dedicated namespace, which is just a best practice regardless. 
because namespaces are a really great security isolation in RBAC. Um, or chances are this will work for basically you and all of your workloads is to just turn off service account token mounting. Um, this field auto mount service account token is that path I showed you earlier. And if you set this to false, um, those tokens to act as that service account will not be in the file system. And that means that, you know, the workload in the pod can't talk to the API server, but chances are it doesn't need to. Your, your web server or your API server doesn't need to talk to the Kubernetes control plane and make configuration changes or anything like that. Um, I would bet that for 99% of your workloads, you can go and copy paste this config to all of your pod specs. Um, if you want to learn more, here's a bit.ly link. Again, pause, go read for yourself, whatever. Um, recap at the pod level, don't use host path, don't use host network, and pay really close attention to your pod's service account. Okay, so that was the sort of workload security. Now let's talk about cluster security. Here you are, you did great with your workload. Now you're responsible for sort of securing up bits of your actual cluster. There you are standing in front of it, wondering what to do. Um, number one, this one's a no-brainer. Keep your cluster up to date. Uh, bugs and vulnerabilities are fixed all the time. And that might sound obvious, but you probably relate to this character who has maybe a 1.16.0 cluster. They got it up and running, it's working fine for them, and they really don't want to rock the boat. Um, and while I can relate to that, you know, updating things is scary and sort of might require rolling updates and things like that, um, consider this. Since the 1.16.0 release, there have been 174 bug fix PRs, not even just PRs total, um, into that release branch. The latest patch version is 116.14. So you should be updating your cluster to the latest patch version at the very least. Um, and if you're curious about those PRs, you can go to this bit.ly link. Um, updating patch versions should be minimally intrusive. You shouldn't have any compatibility issues. Um, and it is a very strong recommendation. Uh, number two, and this is finally to the title of the talk, help, my cluster's on the internet. Well, isolate your cluster from the internet. Um, ideally, your entire cluster is in a private network or behind an auth proxy. It doesn't have any publicly addressable IPs to either control plane components, the API server, or any of your nodes. Um, there should be no way for someone to port scan or just hit your parts of your cluster by just an IP. Um, and you might wonder, okay, well, that, sure, that's more secure, but now my cluster is not very useful. It can't, my web server doesn't work and my devs can't do anything. So what are some solutions to those problems? Well, obviously for your devs and bots, you can log them into the network. You bring them into your VPN. Maybe your organization already has a VPN set up and you just put your cluster behind it. Um, so your devs already have access to it. Or better, uh, or for the other concern, uh, your users need to access your nodes, this is where you might use like a load balancer or a reverse proxy. You put some sort of public load balancing layer that has public IPs that customers can access and then those will forward valid traffic within your VPN onto the nodes. And they can also have good properties like they can provide DOS protection or block random garbage nonsense requests that don't match sort of URLs or um, Another concern might be that your cluster needs internet access. Your cluster needs to go download configs or images or something. Um, in this case, you again, you can just configure your network to allow egress access. And better yet, you can add allow deny lists. You can block requests to, uh, you know, super trusted site.biz, but allow access to your GCR repository or, or Docker hub or whatever. Um, so you can gain a lot of security benefits there. Um, number three on the cluster security for your secrets, use secrets. Secrets are awesome. They're great for access tokens, passwords, um, keys, whatever. Sort of don't use, again, don't use host, host path. Don't store secrets on your node. Um, secrets also have really great properties uh, as compared to like config maps or other types of storage, which is they are never stored in memory. They're never saved on disk to the node or they are stored in memory, but never saved on disk to a node. Um, they're only ever stored on disk in etcd, which you can encrypt. Um, they're loaded as needed, so nodes can't request secrets unless their pods are scheduled on them request those secrets. Um, they're super easy to set up authorization policy, which is great. Um, the only downside is they are limited to one megabyte. They really should just be used for keys and tokens and passwords and not for all your configs ever. 
You can use other stuff like config maps or other larger, uh, more permanent storage for those. If you want to read more on secrets, pause. Here's a bit.ly link for you. Um, quick example of what loading a secret into your pod might look like. Let's say you have some file that used to be on your node naively or, or it's on a dev workstation. You would use something like kubectl to create the secret with the API server. And the secrets are namespace. So you put the secret in the namespace of the app. So we have our sensitive app in its own namespace called app sensitive. Um, that would create an API object with just that namespace, that name, and then a base64 encoded secret. Um, and then in our pod spec, we simply reference it in a volume. So we would mount a new volume we call, let's say, keys, but it can be anything, obviously. And we reference that secret name. And since the namespace is aligned, that secret will be loaded into the pod at that directory that we told it to mount, which is just great. Super convenient, super easy to use, and also much more secure. So recap at the cluster level. Um, keep your clusters up to date. Isolate your cluster from the internet and use secrets. Um, for the node, I just repeat, isolate your nodes from the internet too. That's great. You want to isolate the whole cluster from the internet. Um, user security. So here you are. Here's your dev team. You did such a great job with the cluster. Now your company's got a whole bunch of new engineers and you need to make sure that they're, while they're uploading all their workloads and making amazing products, they are not doing anything to compromise the security of your cluster. So number one, use RBAC and use groups with RBAC. Hopefully you're all familiar with RBAC. You're using RBAC to control authorization policy within your cluster. If you aren't familiar with RBAC, just it's the authorization engine built into all Kubernetes clusters. It has subjects like your, your engineers and your robots and your service accounts. It has roles that grant permission like to get pod and create pod and delete secret. Um, and then it has bindings between the two. So uh, just here's an example of what some RBAC organizational structure might look like. Here's all your subjects. Your organization has six engineers and, and two robots, let's say, two service accounts. Um, these, all these engineers have different uh, sort of roles within the company. Some are SREs, some are SWEs, some are security engineers. And so you define out all these different roles within RBAC to sort of provide least privilege for all these subjects. You've got admins in some namespace, you've got readers and configuration roles and all that. And then you would go through all of your different uh, engineers or all of your different employees and grant them different role bindings to these sort of least privileged roles that you might need um, to accomplish their job. And at this point, all of these arrows represent the role bindings. And at this point, um, you know, you're in a pretty good place. All of your subjects have access to the things they need. Hopefully they aren't overprivileged if you gave your roles some good thought and thought about the bindings in a smart way. Um, Everything's in a relatively safe and secure place right here, um, relatively. Uh, but the problem that happens is what happens, you know, some weeks or months or years from now when, let's say, Bob quits and Dave and Emily switch roles and your CICD platform is recreated with a new identity and new requirements from the permission system. Um, what do we do now? We have this giant web of bindings and we want to make sure that people still have what the access they need, but nobody's overprivileged. Um, this often leads to some pretty terrible like uh, authorization decay of all these bindings where things get really messy and suddenly some employee that quit a year ago has super user on your cluster and nobody knew it, right? Um, and that access was never revoked. So what's a better way to think about this? And that's, and that's to use groups. So again, we have our roles we defined from the previous slide. These are again just toy roles. You can do whatever works best for you. But instead of going directly to subjects, we create groups for each of the sort of different responsibilities within your organization. So say you have SREs, and then you just have engineering, and you have CICD for like deployment, and you have a security group for performing audits or something. Um, you can spend a lot of time and thought binding, creating bindings between these, these uh, groups and roles in a way that you feel is, is very secure, you know, has least privilege and, you know, supports the principle of least privilege. Um, and once these are in a really healthy place, then you can think about your subjects. Who is at this organization and who needs to be a part of what group? And then that would simply be with these memberships and memberships can be, you know, time bound. They can be ephemeral. It's easy to take a user out of a group and put them in a different group when they change roles. Um, and the memberships can constantly be worked on while the groups to roles binding is like rock solid. So one, last, one thing to note, though, is that while RBAC, you know, you can create bindings to groups, 
Groups are typically at your organization on how they're actually implemented. Maybe it's Google Groups. Maybe it's uh, some Microsoft group thing. I don't really know other grouping. There's all kinds of grouping software out there. Um, and I'm sure your organization already has one. But you can basically plug in uh, Kubernetes to read through your group, which is super awesome for user security. If you want to read about RBAC, there's stuff about groups in there. There's bit.ly link. If you want to read about the API spec on all the different fields in RBAC, Again, another bit.ly link, pause, go here. So my final tip, and this one's super huge and super amazing, is to use a policy agent to protect your cluster. Um, typically, uh, or what is a policy agent? Typically it is a Kubernetes admission controller, which selectively allows or denies Kubernetes resource requests based on rules or policies. So that was in a super heavy sentence. You probably fell asleep halfway through it. Um, let me try and explain with it, what, what these things do with an analogy. So think about an airport or a ball game, these foreign concepts that you may or may not have forgotten about in this pandemic world. Um, when you arrive at these places, first you go to like the ticket agent, the guy on the left um, who would check your identity, he would check your ticket, make sure you have like a right to proceed, a right to go forward. Um, you can, you can know, you could proceed um, and then even after that check, you still have to walk through a metal detector. You might have to put your bag through a scanner. Um, and these scanners enforce policies like no alcohol, you know, a check for weapons and metal, and no full 12 ounce things of toothpaste. Those are super dangerous, as we all know. Um, and so in this analogy, on the left, the ticket agent is kind of like our back. He, they know whether or not you have permission to proceed, but no matter how super user you are, how how many permissions you have, you still have to walk through the metal detector and it will still beep whether or not you're someone super special. So the, the scanners are like the admission controllers and you can set them up for your cluster. So rather than checking for alcohol or weapons or toothpaste, they can enforce all kinds of best practices within your cluster that we've been discussing throughout these slides. Host path, host network, they can, you can set policy on service accounts, images, URLs, keys, RBAC, labels, you can require owner labels. And there's just a zillion billion uh, cool features if you, uh, that you can set up. They also can audit the existing resources within your cluster so you can see if you change policies, see what's now out of compliance. It's great. Um, and if you're wondering, okay, well, what is a policy agent? What's an example? There's a bunch of them on the landscape CNCF. The one I'm familiar with and I've used is OPA's Gatekeeper. Probably, I think it's got the most stars on that, on that screenshot. Um, it's super easy, plug and play. If you wanna read about it, there's a bit.ly link. Um, so think back 15 minutes ago to this slide um, where you have your Kubernetes cluster admitting or denying certain containers with some pseudocode policy engine. So what's actually going on behind the scenes? Uh, it's these container specs are being passed through your admission control. And one of those admission controllers is OPA Gatekeeper. It compares the signatures in the container to gatekeeper policies, which might be in GitHub or something. And then it will say, okay, I allow the container that has all these valid signatures and I deny the container that doesn't have the signature or is poorly configured. So as a recap for your developers and automation, use RBAC and groups, use a policy agent to protect your cluster. Um, hooray. So your workloads, cluster, and developer are enjoying a much more secure Kubernetes experience. Uh, you are recognized for your efforts and compensated handsomely. Uh, you're filled with a sense of satisfaction. There you are with your pile of money and your happy Kubernetes cluster. Um, so that's awesome. So before we go to questions, just real quick epilogue here. I know that was a lot. That was a wall of information. That was like 20 plus tips. Maybe you took good notes. You're probably not gonna remember it all. Um, on the bright side, I made a doc. So all the tips and trips, tricks from this, from this, these slides, lots of links, all the, lots of reading if you want to read more and learn more, um, plus a ton of other stuff not covered. I had to cut so much out of this slide. It's already long. All kinds of stuff about pods as root, pod security policy, namespace isolation, basic auth, yada, yada. Um, it is a Google Doc. There's a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash Sam Kubernetes security, or Sam K-A-S sec. Um, yeah. Commenting is enabled. Feel free to ask questions. Okay, any questions? All right, ending the recording. Here we go. How do I end the recording? Uh, stop recording.
Hi, uh, it's me. It's Sam. Uh, I'm a little sleepier because it's early, early in the morning than I was in that video. But hello, I've been uh, watching my recording with all of you um, and reading through tons of Q and A. Um, there's a bunch of questions about slides. I'm I know that this is this is all being recorded. It's going to be on the YouTube, um, and I think the slides might be available too. I'm not sure, but also check out that link I suggested at the end. The Sam K S Security or Sam K eight S Sec SEC SEC. Um, but let me just try and burn through some questions here. There are a ton of questions. Uh, a lot of which, frankly, I don't know the answer to. Uh, this is a huge problem space. I kind of on learned. I sh I had my knowledge and some knowledge from my team, and we all sort of put it together into the slide deck. And there's a ton of really excellent questions in here that I don't know the answer to. So if I don't get to them, Google's your friend. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the doc, and I'll try and find. Uh, answers for you asynchronously. But uh, first question uh, is basically saying, is asking about signatures uh, that I have here. It's like, what what happens if uh, poisoned images are signed? Like what's protecting your cluster from a signed malicious image? And that's a great question. Like the idea is that we want to we want to only give signing keys to trusted building platforms. So like we have our CSED platform that engineers can't really touch like someone configured it it has private keys um and that's that's our sort of last hope at trust so that CICD platform does run all its tests and and bone scans and everything and attaches its signature and sure if if our trusted CICD platform does build a poisoned image we're in a rough place but hopefully we've configured it that it only you know it, it only allows itself to pull from trusted like base images it does all those bone scans and everything so that's my answer for that. Um, next question, let's see. It says, some monitoring s solutions suggest using the usage of host path. Uh, do you consider this malicious? What if it's read only? So I saw a lot of questions like this come up a whole bunch and they're great questions because yeah, there's these fields that I say don't use uh, are used all the time by a whole bunch of different pieces of software. So they exist for a reason. Um, and so this, to answer this question, as well as I think a whole bunch of others, is there are probably a ton of amazing software or amazing like plugins for your cluster that does use these fields. And it's probably perfectly safe. They know what they're doing. They are using the field for a reason because it provides some sort of inspection into the cluster's networking or something. Um, and they're probably pretty safe to use. I think my main recommendation is don't use these fields lightly. Maybe I should have worded it like that in my talk. Um, really think about it. Sometimes they're more convenient to, to sort of like plug your container into your network or the file system, but it's just, it's really risky. So, and there's tons of better, more secure by default ways to sort of achieve your goals. So that's sort of what I have to say about that. Um, second, another highlighted question I had was again about host network. Um, it was asking about the like CPU consumption of not using host network. Frankly, I don't know anything about that. Um, there are tons of caveats and if CPU, if, if this is a real thing, then maybe you need to use host network. Again, these are all suggestions. These aren't the one, this isn't the 100% secure, like follow these rules and you're secure. That's, that's not what I'm promising here. These are just a whole bunch of, of hopefully useful suggestions that you can use on your personal cluster in your organization. Um, another great question is, are secrets secured enough? Aren't they just base 64 hashed? Uh, yeah, that is a concern. Um, some people, some I've read in a like official Kubernetes book that secrets are encrypted by default. Uh, they are not. They are base64 encoded and saved to etcd in base64 encoded. So maybe like a lot of hosted Kubernetes offerings like GKE and I'm sure the other ones uh, do encrypt secrets at rest. So you're in a pretty good place. The real benefit of secrets is how the Kubernetes infrastructure passes them around um, there, you know, you can set really strong authorization policy on all of them. And uh, they are like hard to get access to. Um, sure, if an attacker gets access to the etcd disk, like the, the actual storage of etcd, then you're in a rough place for a lot of reasons. Um, and yeah, they would be able to read secrets. So, but writing really good authorization policy against your secrets is really the benefit and so hopefully that kind of answers that question. Um, there's questions about distroless and why it's preferred. This is sort of a, 
a bunch of people on my team like Distralis. I like Distralis. Um, someone was asking about Alpine. Um, I just did a quick Google search, and yeah, like Distralis doesn't have a default published Alpine um, image, which I thought was interesting. Um, I don't. I would need to research in, more into it. I might post it in my doc uh, again. Bitly doc bit.ly slash sam k eight s sec sec um with pascal casing um i don't know the answer to that but it's a good question uh distralist is preferred uh that's another question why is distralist preferred is like i said in the talk it's it's got a very tiny attack surface no package manager which is something i didn't bring up so you you, you know if your workload gets owned they can't run like apt git you know huge network scanning data exfiltration tool install, you know, so that's an, it's again, just small attack surface. Um, let's see. There's some questions about how to test CVEs in already running images. Um, I don't know if I totally understand that question, but I think what it's, I think basically is as far as my understanding on how to check for CVEs is a bones of the way a bone scanning tool works is it basically just checks the base images and all of the packages that pulled in against a giant map of known vulnerabilities and s checks if there are any CVEs associated with it. So you could run a bone scanner on a running container um, and get probably a pretty authoritative set of known CVEs. Um, there were some questions about the software image. I did a bunch of screenshots from the CNCF landscape with like OPA Gatekeeper and a bunch of CICD platforms. Um, those screenshots were not an exhaustive list of solutions for that. Someone was asking about an Azure uh, CI CD platform. I'm sure that Azure platform is excellent. And if it works great for you, use it. And I'm, there's there's other like there's Google ones I didn't put. Right. So the one the images I put, posted were just the open source ones. I kind of like was biasing towards showing off all the cool open source ones like OPA Gatekeeper is totally open source. Um, but there, I'm sure there's super amazing policy engines, there's super amazing CFCD platforms that are not open source that maybe you're already using or would be a best fit for you. So that's the end of that answer to that. Um, I'm just gonna keep running. I don't know when I'm gonna be cut off, but uh, there are like 200, 300 questions and I've answered like six. So uh, if I don't get to your question again, maybe post it in the, the, the doc sam bitly dot bit dot lee slash sam k eight s sec um let's see what's another good question <laughs> um, there's some questions about using scratch versus distralist um i that's a, that's a space i'm just not super familiar with i haven't used scratch very much maybe maybe scratch is better i know is, i'm pretty sure scratch is like a super bare bones base image too so distralist is not the only super bare bones base image. It's just the one I'm familiar with. It's the one my team suggests um, to other people. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let's see, what's another one? Okay, so here's a question that says, nice approach to signing binaries after each step, but do you have a practical solution in mind? I can't find a solution to that. Oh, I see. Okay, so I think He's asked, this person's asking, um, like, what is an actual, like, piece of CICD software that'll do that for you? And I would wager that most do that. It's based, and I feel like most, it's just, a, most CICD platform probably has, like, phases that you can set up for your release. And yet for each phase, you, I'm sure you can say, like, perform a bone scan, run this bone scan tool. If, you know, if it didn't return an error, um, run a little crypto signature on the image right to the next phase. I don't actually know exactly how they work, but uh, I'm sure there are a lot of ways to do it. Um, let's see. I don't know. One. Uh, I feel like I'm out of time, but no one is yelling in my ear, so I don't really know what's going on. Um, I guess I could talk and go through hundreds of questions. Um, what is the reason that auto mount service account token is not set to false by default? That's a great question. I don't know. Um, the Actually, the Kubernetes docs right now, I had to double check that during the middle of this talk. Uh, they do not specify whether uh, it is set to false by default. I'm pretty sure it's not because they kind of assume, I guess, that a lot of workloads will want those service accounts to talk to the API server, which is a strange assumption in my mind. 
but uh, it it appears that it is true by default. So I don't know. Strange stuff. Okay, I have two more minutes. There we go. Now I know how much longer I've got. Um, let's see. I kind of there are so many questions. So I'm I again if I don't get to your question, I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Is using allowed host paths considered secure? This was one I, I saw when the talk was going on. This is a great question. I didn't know about this field. Um, maybe the talk implies I'm like a super security expert, but the security space is just absolutely so huge that, oh, there's a cool field called that that I didn't know about. And it's under pod security policy. Um, pod security policy, maybe some of you have heard that word before. Um, it, I think, from my understanding, some people on my team who used to like kind of pioneer the pod security policy stuff, it's kind of being deprecated in favor of policy agents like OPA Gatekeeper. Um, but a pod security policy is basically, yeah, a policy as sort of Kubernetes native built in policy agent where you can tell, um, you can tell your pods, but you can, you can specify that like your pod spec can't, can't be certain things. Like, it can include certain host paths. So there's probably a world where, for whatever reason in your organization's infrastructure, your organization's computers, that you really need to mount a host path, like a very specific trusted host path, like path on the, the host, <laughs> which is what a host path is. Um, and you would use like a pod, pod security policy spec or a gatekeeper spec um, to say this is the only allowed host path. Um, I talk briefly on pod security policy, I believe, in my um, supporting doc that is a summary of this chat. Also in that doc, I kind of structured it such that you can make a copy and then you can run through all the bullet, run through all the tips and then basically say like, this is great, I applied it to my cluster, this is not applicable, this doesn't make any sense for me, ignoring it. So hopefully it's like a big checklist for you that you can either uh, try and see if it works for you or ignore it. Um, let's see if I can just read one more question here. Um, again, lots of links, lots of questions about getting access to the slides. I don't know if the slides themselves will be published, but the talk certainly will, and you can pause and fast forward and all that. Um, but the slides might be published too. I don't know. Um, here's a good one that says, cluster update upgrade is a tedious task. How can we best automate this with minimal change? That's a super great question that frankly, I don't know the answer to. Um, I have worked mostly on GKE, and I guess this is a benefit of managed Kubernetes platforms is you like click a button or you make an API call that says upgrade to latest version, upgrade to version foo, and your cluster spins and you know, all of the engineer, all the engineering work has already been done by the Google engineers or your Azure engineers or whatever, and your cluster's now on the latest version. I don't know what the um, best way to automate cluster upgrades, but I would bet that that is a super, super common Google search. Um, <laughs> I would, that's probably a cluster management 101 that you, there is tons of software for, or tons of best practices, tons of blog posts. So if I didn't answer your question and it didn't, it doesn't sound like I know what I'm even saying, which could possibly be true, uh, just Google it. And I pray for you that you will find the answers that you desire. Uh, let's see. I don't know if I have any more time. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm about to wrap up. One last question is just that, like, this was going too fast. I wasn't able to absorb it all. And I did acknowledge that at the end of the slide. I do, it was a dense, dense slide. Um, so go to my supporting doc, bit.ly bit slash Sam KDS sec, um, where you can learn more. Uh, okay. So I got to wrap up. See ya. You're great.